people haven't quite got in yet. Okay, we've got a couple of people who've joined. So yeah, so I'll move back. Or I'll let it go on there a bit. Hi. Hi, Dave. You're always the first one saying hi. <laughs> Aha, so we've got we're we're live, are we? We are. We're going. Happy right. Friday. Um last week I was asked questions and as is often the case, I find I think, oh right, yes, I'd like to say this. But I tend to answer the question and that's all. So one of those questions was had any artist come to me with an idea I was happy to paint. And I said, yes, Ramesses. Um, I don't think I ever said what it was or why I thought that first meeting was very significant. Um, Ramesses' idea for his cover was that it would look like <clears throat> a spaceship taking off. And when you opened it up, you would discover that the spaceship, in fact, is a uh, steeple of a church. And the album was called Space Sinners. So it was, it was a neat idea. And I, in my view, it's a very interesting album. But what was really interesting for me meeting him was that um, we met in a cafe at uh, South Ken Tube Station. Our apartment was right opposite South Ken Tube Station and Edgerton Court. And we had Storm from Hypnosis on first floor and we were on the third floor. Anyway, Ramesses came and we were talking and, you know, we'd been talking for an hour and he told me that there was a journalist and I think he was from Melody Maker, something like that wanted to come and interview him briefly and would I mind and I said no of course not but do you want me to go and he said no 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 we can all chat so the guy came up and he asked Ramesses as a question that I'd often been asked and I just dismissed as unanswerable and the question was where'd you get your ideas from and Ramesses answer for me was enlightening because although I thought it was very funny I also thought it was surprisingly true and what Ramesses said was when I'm sitting calmly and I'm as it were waiting for the ideas once I've emptied my mind and I'm still they come from over here and he pointed over his right shoulder not that either right or left was significant, but what he was basically saying is if he's relaxed and calm, they come. And I, from then on, explored the idea of where do ideas come from? Because I knew so many people in engineering, science, music and art who talked about ideas and they're very often turning up fully fledged all of a sudden ready packaged and all you had to do was unwrap them and I had found that was very much my experience for example designing a sea urchin chair the idea for it just came and figuring out the details wasn't I mean it was pretty much fully formed all I had to do was just establish the details get it sorted and R Ramesses answer was very much a um, I guess an introduction to that way of thinking that catching ideas is like catching a wild animal. You have to be very quiet, very still, and they just come. I was wondering why I couldn't see this. It is, I guess, important. Two things about ideas is they have to, you have to have them. The work, it's an essential part of the work. The ideas are pretty much everything. But then you have to be able to 
bring them into the world. So the two parts are having the ideas in the first place and then reproducing them, bringing them alive. And that was the core conversation in the end that I had with Ramesses. A very interesting one and sub subsequently have had with many other people. Okay, just a quick recap on this. This isn't the painting, it's not even the main subject of the painting. In, to my way of thinking this is an incident on the way to the subject. So it, it's random and accidental geography. The subject matter might not even be seen. It's going to be in the distance. All you might see is the glow or you might see some hints of it. So this is on the pathway towards the subject, the destination. But it's something you're passing and it's in the foreground. So it's got some detail. So what I've done since last we talked, which was Wednesday, is I painted it all over lightly with white, which in actual fact was pale blue. And then I put a transparent turquoise over it to make it look lighter and more luminescent. And now I'm in the process of nailing that internal light source. The, um, the light that's caught on here is blue and the subject is blue. And one of the things I try and do, which is classic painting procedure, is if you have a warm light, the shadows are cool. And if you have a cold light, the shadows are warm. So in this case, the shadows are cold. So the light, to look more convincing, has to be just those few degrees warmer than cold. So although I've started this with the pale blue, I might finish it with a very pale orange or a very pale pink. So this is it, the groundwork, nearly complete. Then I'll move on. So um, for those of you who ask that I don't ask questions because um, Dad should focus on painting and not talk, I <laughs> hope that's demonstrated that whether or not I ask questions, Dad's going to talk to you <laughs> and not paint. Well, so. great so. But I do have questions from people. Go on. Um, okay, where should we start? Um, sorry if I missed your names again. One of the things that happens is if the question's a little bit long, the name goes out of shot. Um, but put your name if you'd like. Um, someone asked, do you ever, um, have you ever woken up with an idea and had to write it down in a notebook? Um, I've often woken up with ideas and I've never had to write it down. I, they seem to hang around, fortunately. So it's not like getting up and in the middle of the night making a note. I'm perfectly confident that in the morning they'll be there. And who knows, I could be totally wrong and they've gone. I may have had hundreds of fantastic ideas that there's no trace of. But I don't think it works for me like that. I think they, they kind of obsess me for days. Um, so I get, I'm very familiar with seeing your name Chengis, Chengis, um, and I really hope at some point maybe you could tell me how it's spelt phonetically or something, um, but uh, Chengis wants to know what was the idea behind the drama cover? Hmm. <laughs> I want you to paint a picture where there was nothing in the picture that wasn't plausible, that couldn't exist. Um, no floating rocks, no strange creatures, and yet I still wanted that sense of drama. So it was an interesting challenge for me in the first instance. 
but there isn't much there. There's a kind of mini narrative with the birds and the cats. There's um, something interesting for me going on in the sky. And there's that rock formation that could have been an iceberg. And then in the middle distance, there's the shipwrecks in the middle of the desert. So there's, um, there's plenty of quasi narrative material, but in many respects, it's a very simple painting, which I enjoyed. I, I love the, the feel of it, the effect of it. Shall I carry on? Sorry? Shall I carry on with questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Will Baker wants to know, do you ever paint with anything other than brushes? <laughs> Will, I'll answer it, but we have to have shorter letters. <laughs> yes, I, I do. Um, when I um, started doing the sketches for this painting, I was using what's essentially presented like a brush but it's actually a, a squeegee and really all I was doing was pushing paint around and yeah um, I've used cloths I've used all kinds of things fingers but the bottom line is brushes do the job and I got a lot of them Dad wants to know what your thoughts on Banksy are. Who does? Dan. On Banksy? Mm. What sort of thoughts should I have? Well, the one, tell us the ones you have already. Well, I love his sense of humour. So that's a starting point. And of course, as far as I know, um, he started off in Brighton. So I was seeing his work before I had a clue about how mysterious it was going to be. Yeah. Which one did with, which one are you thinking of? Because he had the, he had the kissing policeman one on the side of the Albert pub. That's the one that I remember. Yeah, there was a couple in Beaconsville Road as well. Really? Yeah, don't. <laughs> was we, it the girl? It wasn't the girl with the balloon, was it? Oh, I can't remember. But there were underneath the viaduct, I think. Oh, and by the roundabout, there was a couple. Yeah, the viaduct one is the kissing policeman on the pub. I think. Okay, all right. Mm. But you like his sense of humour? I do, yeah. 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 Like his work. Um, Paul wants to know, do you paint the background with the texture of the foreground in mind? No. I use a roller and I have no thought to anything that might happen next. So, yeah, it's... Um, ben wants to know, and actually a few people have asked, how do you define your style? And it's often in reference to fantasy or science fiction in the comments. But how do you define your style? I don't think my style is either fantasy or science fiction, actually. Um, I think of it as a cut. I think I'm basically a landscape artist and a designer. Um, I was sitting with Sid Mead once when he was asked a similar question and his answer was that he designs everything to be built and some don't get built and some do and those that don't get built could be categorized as fantasy because they they never came into existence and those that did come into existence become everyday objects and cease to be fantasy. Um, I don't use the word, but the original meaning of the word fantasy is from the Greek and it means things that come from the mind as, a, as opposed to observation. But um, as a subject matter, 
I'm not really interested in the idea of science fiction. I'm hugely interested in the idea of designing the future. So, yes. Who are you talking to? <laughs> Over there I'm on the right. <laughs> I'm talking to this person and this person. <laughs> if I turn around, I get shouted at. Get on with the paint. Oh, Tammy asks, my family wants to know, uh, the question's gone, but about t-shirts. And Tammy, today I want to show you something I ordered up, <laughs> which I'm really happy about. And it's a t-shirt with Dad's blue... What do you call that painting? The Forest of the Night? Yeah. In the Forest of the Night. In the Forest of the Night. After the William Blake poem. Yes. Because it has a tiger in it. Uh, so I'll show you that t-shirt. I was just experimenting to see what an all-over print would look like. And I'll, and I'll show you. So yes, we will do t-shirts. Um, Chengis has asked a couple of times, and um, uh, I need to find out how to phrase this because I missed writing it down completely. Um, in your tales of topographic oceans, are the star constellations, the horoscope patterns in constellation of the band members of Yes? Yes. Cool. That was simple. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. I didn't know. Was that your idea? I can't remember. Oh, wow. Well spotted, Chengis. <laughs> <laughs> is that public knowledge? I think it is, actually. Huh. Oh. People are keen on the t-shirts. Yeah, the, <laughs> the thing is about the tale from topographic oceans I've had so many letters and people see so much in it um, stuff that I know is in it and stuff that I'm amazed that they've seen it and they point it out to me and uh, yeah it's I'm honoured that people take the time and trouble to see so much in it it's interesting to me There was apparently a Banksy in Sterling that someone painted over. Well, that's what happened in Brighton, wasn't it? They put that Perspex box around it so nobody could touch it. Did you see that? I saw it, yes. Yeah, mm. I was aware of that, yeah. Hmm. Um, Mike wanted to know, after you sell a painting, do you retain the rights? Yes. A painting... Um, comes in three parts if you like it's the one can license the reproduction of it and one can control those licensing rights one controls the copyright and one controls the original and those three things are different aspects so if I'm talking to young artists and the if they want any one piece of advice, I, I say be very reluctant to part with the copyright. Fortunately, you can't do it accidentally. You have to do it intentionally and for good value, i.e. you're selling it and hopefully with a proper agreement. But yeah, on balance, you, shouldn't, you should be very reluctant to part with it. Um, Will noticed a hooded crow trying to exit the painting and then when he said that particularly looking through the screen can you see it? No. <laughs> it's, it's that middle bit, that dark bit. This? Like, the, like this bit here. Well you have to show me. Don't come I don't up want to go it. in the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you later. Oh. But what it made me think was I remember when we were learning at college how to paint one of the bits of advice our tutor Andrew Beckett who is a brilliant teacher shout out um, he said one of the ways of getting the composition right is to draw the negative space so if you're painting objects that have a relationship or um, or even faces or anything if you draw the negative space then it helps you to get it much more correct you're not preempting yourself so much he was very clever. Yeah. I remember. Mm. Freya's tutor that she's talking about was teaching 
scientific and natural history illustration and was very good. The college was very lucky to have him, as were the students. But he's not there anymore, sadly. OK. Tell me, come and show me what you're talking about, because otherwise other people might want to know. OK, OK. Um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Will, but I think this is the crow, and that's the goose, and it's walking out like that. And what is it? A crow. It is in the painting. Is that the crow you mean, Will? We'll find out. I have words later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, yes, okay, yeah. Um, Peter wants to know if you could describe what you have planned for the left side of the painting. You're going to have to start on that because people are going to keep asking. Well, they're probably bored with this. <laughs> there might be another piece of this here. I haven't made up my mind yet. But in the distance, there's going to be a glow, which is the subject matter of the painting. It's, I very often make the subject matter distant or hidden with mist and fog, rather than paint it full on up front. And I love the mystery and the sense of anticipation that creates. So, as I said, this is just part of the geography of the journey. And at the end of the journey is going to be the subject matter, which may have some bits showing and may be entirely hidden. But you'll know it's there. Um, someone has asked, I don't know if this is a question for me to ask now or they want me to harass you after the video but they would like some videos of you talking about your architecture. So maybe that could be the next season two, the sequel. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, I'm very happy to do that. I, I guess that I can sort of segue into that as I complete this. Um, sorry, again, I missed the name of who asked this question, um, but someone asked, um, what's the story of this album and this cover? I, at this point, I wouldn't want to go into that any more than I already have, in that it's a journey to a place. And, yes. What about for yes? Do they have a story in mind for this tour or is it I think all the story that Yes had in this tour was in two forms really I guess one is the songs and the other I would say what I've said before is that to a degree there was um, some hint of this in the uh, tour programme which was part of the story of um, Fragile, Close to the Edge, and Yes Songs. Uh, Pete wants to know if you snack while you're eating. Uh, not while you're eating. <laughs> <laughs> Do you snack while you're painting? I guess, sometimes. Depends, you know, I... I haven't done it this week, but sometimes I paint for 10 or 15 hours, 18 hours on occasion. So yeah, I might stop and make a meal or I might not, you know. In the morning, I'm not likely to eat and that's when I do my best work and I do most work. So I don't see it as a constructive part of the process. Just a survival bit as the day wanes. Mm. What I'm looking at is where I need to go to make the shape come alive. So where you're looking to put the light? Yeah, that's exactly right. Do 
best give you the deadline? Um, there was a second part of that question that I missed. Actually, if you could write that question again, sorry. It sort of got shifted up a bit too quick. Why was your blue desert painting so big? I just thought it was fun to work that size. But it was such a pain in the ass getting it in and out of the studio that I thought, nah, not going to do that again. I but, really like that painting. Yeah. And I, it was fun doing it that size. But it did ma make handling very difficult. I, I, I'm not going to say I won't ever do that again because I enjoyed it enough that I probably would. But it was a problem. Chengus asks, you've painted deer twice. Do they have any particular meaning? No. no. I like Chengus's questions. I think you should answer them after you've listened to more Clarissa Pinkola Estes analysing stories for their oh. I'm gonna, <laughs> symbolic I had what for me at the time was very annoying but in retrospect was a very funny experience because the the Anderson Bruford Wake when Howe blue desert painting which was nine foot by six foot was very big and there was um, an equal a painting of the same size on the inside which I think I called red desert and it had the disappearing snake. Mm. Asked me about last time. And um, I asked Virgin, is it going to be a problem if I take it off the stretcher and roll it up? Can they fly it? Because it would be in a 10 foot tube. And they said, no, no problem at all. So I took the painting off the stretchers, which are the wooden frame that the canvas is stretched over. And it had to, the tube had to be big enough to take the longest stretches, which were nine foot. So the tube was 10 foot to get the longest length of the canvas, which had to fold round them. So it was a 10 foot tube by about 18 inches. And it was a big plastic, I think it was for underground plumbing, but it was big and cumbersome. So go through customs and I, this is at Newark. Newark is a very civilized airport now but it wasn't so back then and the painting came through. I'd been already been through immigration. I was going to go through customs. I picked up my painting on a tiny little trolley which already had a couple of suitcases on it and I was balancing this painting on the trolley and a customs officer signaled me said come come to me so okay i was heading off towards this customs officer and somebody from behind barged past me and knocked it flying which i caught it but it was you know all over the place and another customs officer came running up to me and he had his hand on his gun and he ran up and he said are you trying to kill somebody I said, just a minute, I haven't made up my mind yet. <laughs> Fortunately, this was before 9-11, he laughed. He took me through customs, down to the taxi rank and got them to get me a van. So he was really helpful. So that was, I was lucky, I guess, because I'm told you shouldn't joke with customs officers. But yeah, it was not, it was not easy traveling with those paintings and then when I got to my hotel, I had to reframe it. So it was a palaver. Okay, I'm being ordered back to work. I might look at this for another hour without realizing exactly what I've got to do. Well, you do that because someone has said something that I'd quite like to um, address and ask you guys about. Um, Jeff said, I feel like I should be paying to watch you work, which is really nice. Um, but it sort of relates to something we've been considering, which is um, if we go on, what we should do about advertising, because ideally it would be advertising free. And if it was to be 
you know, lessening the experience, we wouldn't want to do it. Um, so absolutely the live streams, of course, and no advertising. Um, and while the sessions are still going on on YouTube, no advertising and maybe no advertising ever. I think it would be good for us to hear your views on that. And if you think it would be very detrimental to, I guess, I must admit, I'm not inclined to go down the advertising route. Right, okay. Just me then. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> when I'm painting, um, I have to spend a great deal of time just staring at it. So if I did an 18 hour day painting, I might actually be transferring paint to the canvas for a quarter or a third of that time and the rest of the time wondering what to do next. Not in any anxious way, just I love watching it and seeing, oh, I'll do that, I'll do this. So it's, it's a comfortable process. Yeah, people, people not feeling the advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Okay, so it, it got a no vote, did it? It did indeed. I'll have to think of something else. <laughs> <laughs> People saying Patreon to get subscription live streams. I will look into that. Thank you. So are you um, are you running out of questions, Brett? No, I've got loads of questions. I'm just looking at all the people objecting to the advertising idea. Okay, well, you can move on. Okay, let's do that. Um, someone has asked, and not for the first time, um, what's happening about the Floating Islands animation? Is that project still ongoing? Yes. In a word, it's still ongoing. Um, I'm working with Alistair Bordsley. He's been writing drafts and redrafts of the story. Um, we've been, in a way, we should have been taking advantage of this lockdown to get it pushed forward. Um, and we might do that, still might do that. So. The answer is yes, that's an ongoing project. And from about a year ago, almost exactly, it had a, it had a good push forward, but it's not in the hands of any major studio or um, any finance thing. We're, we're working on what we can work on between us, which is story and... Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna have a little, do a little close up. Okay. I just want to say thank you to Lisa, who who said she'll buy enough tea towels to, what was your exact phrase, <laughs> keep me in bread, something like that. <laughs> it's much appreciated. Um, someone had a good idea, again I missed the name, that we do like bonuses for people who are patrons on Patreon. And what I was thinking in terms of a bonus, well, like all of your stories where you mention like Ramesses and um, uh, what's his name, who did the editing of your books or wrote the foreword? Uh, Sid. Not Sid. Rick? No. You've been trying to contact him recently. The American guy who's living in Florida. Donald, Donald Lemkel. Yeah. And Sid Barrett. Um, you tell the stories of the artwork and the projects, but you've told me lots of really scandalous and interesting stories <laughs> about terrible things they've done. Maybe that could be the bonus. No, I can't Give tell. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break, Fred. You're in trouble. <laughs> it's private. It's a pri you know, these are public. <laughs> Just a thought. Yeah, um, very bad thought indeed. Okay. Lemkel, yes, Paul Denham, Donald Lemkel. Um, Stephen asks, shall I zoom out again? Am I in your way? No, fine, wherever you're comfortable. Um, Stephen asks, is Magritte an inspiration? Um, no, not really. He was for Storm, of course. 
uh, Storm's first book was called Walk Away Rene, as in Rene Magritte. Um, and that can be seen very much in his work. Yeah. I don't really think of myself as surrealist in any way, so no. Like his work, but not an influence. Kengis wants to know why you're interested in towers and bridges so much. I think um, they have a fantastic philosophical power. It's when you say a word like kendo, which is what I studied for many years and practiced for many years, the do in kendo is the same as tau, and it means way, the way of the sword. Um, and its implication is that you get enlightenment, enlightenment through study and practice. And I find that the pathways and bridges are huge, the attractive metaphor for a spiritual path. And I find that even in the paintings, they have some of the power that they have in real life. So I like to bring them in. Can't resist it, really. I wish I could find that research, but I'm, I've told you a hundred times we had that seminar at university and they were telling us about this research where they asked thousands of people around the world in different cultures and different countries what they wanted to see in paintings. Oh, yes, you and did there tell was, me. There were certain things all... Um, pretty much everyone wanted to see. They all liked seeing trees with a low fork and they all liked a body of water, diverse flora and fauna, but a pathway that you couldn't see the end of as well. Mm. And I think all of those things are explicable, you know, survival wise, mm. but a pathway I thought was interesting. I guess it's an escape thing. I'm so, sorry, are you looking at me because I'm saying too much? No, 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 I was not. I was... Um... I know where I know where that came from. You do? Yes, it was that book called Joy. No, 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 no. This was like ten years ago that we had this lecture. Oh, okay. Well, it's in the book. Is it? Yes. Oh, I must finish that book. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> okay. How are we doing? Um, it's thirty-six, I think. Thirty-eight. So you got seven more minutes. Okay. Shall I show the T-shirt? Show the t-shirts, but ask me some questions so I can talk while you're doing it. Okay, let's see what question we've got. Um, Nick would like to know if you're going to do, if, if you have done or if you intend on doing any jigsaws. We, we could do those. We keep getting asked and I guess I'm, it's one of those things that um, I guess we should investigate. Um, I've never intended to do it, but... Uh, yeah, it might be fun. I don't do jigsaws, so it doesn't cross my mind every day. Well, Travis wants to know, will another book collection be forthcoming soon? Well, we've talked about this. Um, the fourth book, I about a couple of years ago, I thought I had it finished, but I've done so much work since. We're going to have to revisit. And we, we are planning to publish it ourselves. So the answer is yes. And hopefully... In this lockdown period, we might get to finish it. And the mannequin. Can you? Can you? Uh, you just <laughs> <laughs> so this is the T-shirt that we got printed up. Can you show the back as well? In the forests of the night. Yeah, and it's really, it's really lovely quality. Unfortunately, I forgot to do. Um, I forgot to do the collar. But apart from that. It feels really nice, it's very soft. So, because this worked, I think we'll try doing some different designs, but if you guys have designs that you'd particularly like to see, I'd love to hear which ones that you like. Um, and should we do a couple more questions? Oh, um, <coughs> sorry, I missed the name again. I think it was Maya? Mm. Um, wanted to know, do you ever suffer from artist block? Artist block? Mm. 
Um, assuming you mean that the artist's equivalent of writer's block. No, not really. Um, I shared a, a desk with somebody at a conference in Boston. And he was a writer and he was talking about writer's block. And he said he found the critical way of making sure writer's block didn't affect him he was a writer was that he would when he was writing he would not edit what he wrote he would just let it flow and later in another room on another day he would edit and as long as he kept that analytical part of his brain away from the creative process he didn't suffer from a block and his view was that the block came when you the editing analytical part interfered with the creative part. And I found that to be profoundly true. And, you know, when you're letting ideas flow, going back to Ramesses and letting them come from over your right shoulder, yes, the trick is not to interfere. Don't start analyzing, don't start categorizing, just let it flow. And thank God it does. And it does, and it does, and it does. Um, one of the problems I had at art school was that the process that the colleges thought triggered creative thinking was what they called systematic analysis. And I thought it was the death of creative thinking. It was putting all the blocks and obstacles in a row that you had to get round to come up with an idea. And it absolutely was no help in coming up with an idea. Taking all the blocks away and then figuring it out was much more effective. Okay. So I guess the answer is, that's it, no. And the way to avoid that problem, don't analyse, don't worry. Worry is a terrible impediment to creative thinking be relaxed trust in the process trust that it'll happen and you know get the pencil or paintbrush or whatever tool you're using get it moving don't let it wait I think that's a nice note to finish on we're getting lots of very good questions um, we're going to be doing this again on Monday at seven it's monday wednesday and friday at seven um so if you've been asking questions and i haven't got to them please come back and ask again because there's lots i would like to ask dad i'm trying to make notes of all of them but i'm not quite quick enough to get everything sorry about that <laughs> be quick um but yeah i kind of just was thinking the other day it's a really nice bunch of people that are joining us for these thank you yes. so it's really fun for us doing this um and yeah. thank you for being such a wonderful bunch of people yeah it's really nice for me because obviously dad doesn't see all of your comments until after but while i'm watching all of this going through it's just it's all really positive and lovely and good questions and yeah it's a nice thing to do Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. And if there's any children left, thank you. <laughs> watching. <laughs> any children left watching. Thank you very much. <laughs>